Welcome to the Peaceful Days podcast series in collaboration with Life is a Hideous Thing, the official Dave Pibus podcast. Peaceful Records, a label that started in 1987 and remains fearlessly independent to this day, one which has never been afraid to take risks and do things differently. Its core mission, to always challenge and push the boundaries musically. I worked there from July 1990 to October 1993, been involved with some of the label's most influential signings. This episode of the Peaceful Days podcast series features At The Gates. Peaceful Days podcast series episode three with Thomas Lindbergh of At The Gates. Doing the uh, initial sort of research, I saw you guys were playing Download Festival. Yeah, that was that was uh, a bit different for us. <laughs> well, kind of, kind of weird because I think one of the distinct memories I have of you guys being at the Peaceful Offices, this was like 94 or 95, you set off in a van on on a small tour in England, and I, I think just about ten minutes later, you guys called us saying we've had a puncture already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it was always you know like pretty punk rock and and very down to earth, and it still is. That's the thing. We arrive at a download, you know, and it was just us and one crew guy. That's you know still the same thing, isn't it? <laughs> we, just, we just happen to know how to cope with that, those kind of situations because we've been along for such a long ride. So we can manage to do that 30 minute changeover on a big stage and download. You know, we, we can do that with just us and, and one guy and get there on time and so so on. And we're not, but it's just experience, really. It, we haven't changed and, you know, our attitudes towards stuff hasn't changed. Of course, you know, our precision might have changed that we get these kind of offers, but... Now, I, I would be as happy to play the, you know, download at all. Like the small stage there was, was brilliant. I saw Bombus play there. Uh, fantastic. I, I kind of, I feed off the energy anyway, you know, wherever we go. In Cradle, we had this conversation where some of the guys, like, uh, attitudes was like, treat every gig the same. If it's like, you know, someone's back garden, we're going to kill them. And if it's download, we're going to kill them. It doesn't matter which. And, exactly, yeah. And sometimes, obviously, playing a back garden, I wouldn't get that nervous. And then playing download, I shit myself. <laughs> so it was a little bit different. Well, it, is, it is a bit of both, actually. I mean, if, if you can actually see people in the audience, which you can't at download, and you no. can at, like, the smaller places, that can actually scare me more. Especially if you kind of know half the people. If you play Gothenburg, for example, in a small club, that's more, you know, because we would have to live with that the rest of our lives if we fuck up there, you know. But also, I think we come to terms with who we are and, and that we are very serious about our performance and, you know, to put up a good performance for, for the people that are there. That's a thing that's changed over time as well, you know, with with uh, with age, actually. A positive thing with age is, like, you don't really care that much about how people perceive you in, in, in per se, you know. Yeah, fuck them anyway. <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind of. It's that kind of attitude where, I don't know, I, I, it, it's only happened since I've left the music biz that I've decided not to really care what people think about me anymore. Because obviously, yeah. like, being in a band like Cradle, you, there's a certain angle of, like, people that attack you for wearing makeup and being a sellout and all this shit that goes along with it. Um, yeah. And in reality, I mean, you knew me before that. I wasn't really that kind of person, so... Most of the guys from Cradle that I've known over the years, and I know, I know a few, like... If you put them together, it'd probably be like two or three lineups. But you know, exactly, yeah. they're all they're all pretty, pretty down to earth people. But yeah, I, I I'm totally down with that. I wasn't I wasn't away from the whole music scene as you probably were, but because I did a lot, a lot of small stuff while at the gates was kind of sleeping. But 
I was away from the major like metal scene for for a bit, and that probably that's probably where I changed my mind and attitude about yeah. what is important. You know, getting a family together and all that, and, and a different purpose in life than than just playing metal. You know, like career as a teacher and all that. It's that that kind of made me change my perspective because all that stuff will still be there even if we fuck up. If we even if we recorded an album that people, you know, the comeback record, if it, people would think that was totally shit. Yeah, I, I still have all the rest of the stuff, and I, I would still like the record. So <laughs> we are very down to earth when we are on tour as well. We are, you know, for me it's very important that I. Yeah, I kind of figured this out a couple of years back, and and uh, it's not like it's rocket science either. But uh, because I'm a teacher and and I'm a you know father and and, and a husband, and then I'm uh, I'm a singer. But I, I want everybody that I know and meet to. I don't want it to see me step out in and out of roles. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I mean, the kids in class should come should be able to come to an Atlas show and recognize me and not feel like. Well, what is he doing here? What what is what is all this? You know, what what is his attitude now? Or whatever, whatever. And the same thing with my, you know, musician friends. They should be able to show up in my school. You know, I wouldn't feel weird. You know, you know, this stepping in and out, out of roles. Yeah. Also fucks a little bit with your head, I think. Because I've not seen you for like twenty years. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? I mean, we have a lot of mutual friends that we, you know that I have met during the years, but. <laughs> we haven't met. That's it is it is a bit weird. Yeah, because I was playing with Adrian for five years. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. That's that's one of our mutual, our mutual friends. <laughs> but a, a lot of people seem to miss out the very earliest of when you guys started out. So um, that's what I'm interested in. At the Gates sort of ended in, what, 96? And yeah. the peaceful sort of angle was... Because um, I was like the graphic designer there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, obviously I worked with you guys on more or less the first two albums. And then the third one... I think you guys at a company do it, and I just got the films for that. And yeah. That was really nice because one, the artwork was amazing, and two, I didn't really have to do anything but stick a barcode on there, and it was really awesome. And you did everything, and so casting your mind right back to the first album, I guess you guys were speaking to Johnny uh, more than particularly Ham. Yeah, we, we, yeah, that that was like the, our go-to guy in, in a way. I mean, you you were there, and and Hammy was there. But I think Johnny was like the guy we always talked about, you know, for the for the first one. Well, technically, I, when I started at Peaceville, Hammy wanted me to do the press. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, but, but you ended up doing art. Oh, I hated it so much. And you might relate to this, because especially with your first couple of albums, is that, you know, I'd get these, like, new records from new bands, and I'd send them off to, like, all the press people. And then I'd, yeah. have, to, I'd have to call them a week later and say, did you get that record? And they're like, yeah, I don't, I don't like it. And, yeah, I'm going to review it and give it, like, <laughs> two out of ten. And I'm like, please don't. It's, you know, you try and give it a bit more time <laughs> yeah it's harsh yeah and the bands don't really even see that you know <laughs> you know yeah, but we, we, we got a pretty we got a few really horrible <laughs> reviews for the first one i remember that <laughs> it's funny like nowadays they all say oh yeah at the gates are like a classic band and i was into the first three albums i'm thinking no you weren't <laughs> no you weren't I, I love it when you know it was like this comment this uh you know how adrian is you know there was there was this internet comment you know on, on um I think it was after our show in Budapest last week, and there was one guy, you know, one of those like the old school fans, which I mean, we love all our fans for, you know, but, but he was like listening to this right now, and he, there was like a link to a song of the first record, and Adrian just posted, you know, why? <laughs> it's like, that's like how cynical we are about it. But it's like, I think everything happens for a reason. Those early records, we had to do, you know, all this weird experimentation and you know all that stuff to, to get get where we were on Slaughter of the Soul we had to like get all, all, all that youthful enthusiasm out of the way to... you guys had like a very steady progression that was actually quite fast it took about four years from what doing the Gardens of Grief sort of demo the, I remember yeah. Johnny was always banging on about it like I want to do the demo like he wanted to do that all the time he was more underground than even the bands you know he was like he signed a lot of really cool bands that... well, what is he doing now we, we just talked about that the other day what happened to Johnny do you know no <laughs> I'm, I'm have, not... you, have you met him since, since the days no I don't even know where oh, he okay. is uh, weird because he was so dedicated to, to the underground as well I mean that just I, yeah, I've seen it happen to other people and like you know he just disappears the whole nerve for the underground the whole you know but for him i hmm. I, I couldn't see that I, I i would see him still being involved as as a fan at least you know maybe he's so underground we don't know about it i don't know literally yeah yeah yeah, but, yeah we're, we're we're so overground so we don't even <laughs> yeah <laughs> maybe that's that's probably the fault 
Those old days, man. Yeah, it's crossing the street for, from from the peaceful office to the, to the pub, looking the wrong way on the on the street. You know, that's yeah. I will never forget these memories. Because I I can't remember the first time you guys visited the offices, and it must have been on the first record. It must have been, yeah. Was it just you, uh, maybe? Maybe it, first time it might have just been me or me and someone else doing press, but I it probably I I remember the whole band being there at least once or twice because I, I remember sometimes when if the ba- if a band was like around we'd have to put them up because yeah. they had nowhere to stay and then there might be a day off so we'd have to entertain you guys and they'd take you out and get <laughs> drunk and, you know what I mean but we always did that with all the bands when, whenever we play England I, I get the same feeling still you know because that's, that's really where, where it all started you know, of course, we had like this one or two years here in Sweden when you know you're just playing the you know the squats and the the youth clubs, whatever. But you know, when they actually got to be like almost a real band, being signed to label and playing shows abroad, it was always England. It still feels special when we go back there, you know, because it feels like I've been in England so many times now. So it's kind of crazy. So yeah, going back to the first album, and this was something I t- spoke to Chris about was that you guys seem to have like your first logo. Who who designed your first logo? There like, was always Alf for the guitar player. He was he was like the arty guy of the band. But you can see it like you know on the on the mini album or the demo. You know he was just like more crude <laughs> anyway. But then on the first record uh, for the Red and Sky Hours, he he, he kind of developed it into these church windows thing. Yeah. Pretty weird. <laughs> well, I remember getting that in the in the mail because we used to obviously mail back then, and I got this package yeah. with um, the slide for the cover. And um, and then the logo, I think it was on like just normal paper. The actual text for the Red in the Sky is ours was actually like biro drawn on a lined piece of paper. It's also Alf, yeah. <laughs> it was <laughs> crazy, isn't it? Really basic. Um, and then obviously when I got it scanned onto the record, it looked perfect. And then wh- whose hand is that on the on the cover? That's actually Anders' hand. Right, cool. I never knew. As that. I can remember it, because it's uh, the picture is actually taken by the twins' uh, father. You know, he was a hobby kind of photographer, and I, I think we we had one idea first. This really famous Swedish uh, photographer, Lennart uh, Nilsson, who takes photos like inside people. When I was a kid, he had this great book about like, you know, how how a baby is, you know, in 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 the utero and stuff like yeah, that. It's like yeah. inside pictures. You know, really technical photography inside the human body. You know, with this weird camera he had and he, we wanted one of his pictures inside a human heart as a cover because it was all red you know and it was like inside a heart we thought that was pretty cool but i think it was so expensive and we we held we were stubborn as we always was we held on to that idea until it came to the point of like well either you know we have to figure something out in two days otherwise we're we don't have a cover and then we kind of did this thing with his uh, father, you know, this is like a, a stone, like it's shaped as an egg or something. Yeah. And, yeah, and it's the same same hand, the same stone is in the video for the Kingdom Gone thing as well. There was probably an idea that I had that, you know, that went somehow symbolic together with the lyrics. But uh, I'll be damned if I remember that symbolism right now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> well, it's 25 years ago, of course. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> The cover, the cover looks good with the colors and and everything. It really, you know, it's a it's a very red cover, and people still remember it. I think that was one of the like maybe tenth or twelfth albums I'd done, and I had all the information and the pictures from you guys, and everything was kind of professionally done, and I really enjoyed doing that. Johnny was always hassling, like, because obviously you were on the sub label Def Records. And so yeah. Johnny was on his desk and Hammy was on his desk and Hammy was like, you know, you got to do the new album for whoever. And Johnny was like, oh, and in your dinner hour, can you do this record? <laughs> and I'd be like, yeah, yeah, okay, you know, just yeah. patch it all together. And it was like, I think further down the line, as I became more confident and Johnny became more confident too, that the records on Def became more, I don't know, they, they, they became more professional. And that yeah. was one of the sort of better ones I did at that time some of the earlier ones were so messy didn't you do Baphomet and Vital Remains and these yeah it was because that's more like you know it, it looks cool but it, it old school but it looks like demos on CD yeah I like that style too because it's really like this is underground this is how we do it <laughs> old school yeah well if if you look at Autopsy's Mental Funeral or maybe even Dark Throne's first album if you look at the back it's a complete mess because they were telling me to use <laughs> like 20 different fonts and it was all, there's no Photoshop back then, so you had to just kind of guess. And then when it came back, you, you couldn't afford to have it fixed. You just had to leave it. <laughs> the the first album for you guys was very, like, all kind of the same fonts and very clear and kind of professional looking. Um, and I really liked that. It was It was a very nice album. And then moving on to the second album was even better because I loved the artwork. And then you guys changed your logo. 
Yeah, yeah, and that's the logo we we use now. Instead, we really wanted to because I really like that. You know, it's like a you know like an old typewriter. Where did that come from? Uh, I don't know where the font came from. Actually, really, maybe I don't. Maybe it even was you. I can't remember. The artwork was. Um, I just found it in a book. This guy, he's written books. He's done music. He used to be this really cool avant-garde artist in Sweden. This guy who did the cover and. I remember, like, we fell in love with that with those pictures, and we just said, like, how much do you want, you know? And he, his only thing was like, is it a commercial record? Like, are you, you know, are you, are you playing commercial music? <laughs> we said, no, no. <laughs> none whatsoever. And then he's just like, yeah, you can have it for free. So he just gave us slides for free. So that's well, that was really cool. I still remember that. I guess the first album was red. You guys were like, okay, we're going to change it to like what's on the slide, which is kind of blue, and that really happened. I'm trying to now remember that. Uh, about the logo because we'd only just got a computer where you could print yeah. out you could type you know on the screen and then print it out and then i maybe photocopied the logo like 10 times to break it up so oh, little, yeah okay, so yeah. it looks a little bit like uh like a font i guess but now it's actually real i actually broke it up with a photocopier that's cool because i mean yeah the guy who did the new cover we, we said we wanted a similar logo as with fear rock is the burning darkness on 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 like what was reality you know yeah and uh you know it's just break out people's expectations of what the record was going to be you know if it was a sort of a so logo people were expecting that if we went all the way back to the first logo yeah. people will be like oh they're they're trying to please us with this also so we said like let's do the second one which is really clear and you know and the, the guy was like where can i find this font and we <laughs> told him to try try to come as close as possible i think yeah it's impossible so i, I i'll have to tell him that i that's actually broken up with a photocopier. I'll, I'll tell you that. <laughs> yeah, because it, it was. I think that was the way I used to do it. Was um, you know, to make it kind of like grimy. Was um, yeah, yeah. Just for. I mean, the photocopier was like a cool, very cool tool for a graphic designer because it, it had that effect. I guess in Photoshop you can do that now, but it's not. It's not as much fun. And, well, it, it, and it's probably still will have the. You know, it will be more digital grainy which is kind of looks weird and it's yeah you can see it's false whereas this one is actually real it's actually a physical breakdown of the ink so that's a bit i mean until we just talk now i didn't realize that so i can take credit for doing your logo whereas you take credit for doing yeah. the dark throne logo <laughs> yeah yeah that's true well that, that's, that's another story yeah yeah but that, that was long before they were you know they were actually Signed. a professional band really you know and that was again uh, sent to us on a piece of paper that was like biro yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was kind that's, of weird. Uh, like. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. I mean, and, and uh, Gilbert, or I mean Fenris, yeah, Fenris. Uh, has kind of like acknowledged that, you know, the whole actual logo is, is me. He did the, um, what what happened was they were, you know, they were doing a demo with that, you know, and he wanted Nikke, you know, to, to, to draw the cover. So Nikki draw this zombie creature coming out of a swamp, wherever it is. And uh, and he, uh, Gilbert wanted my logo, so he put them two together. And then then it's like you know logo by Fenris, Nikki and Tompa, you know. So, ah. so but but he I think he like you know did little small changes to the logo, but I mean it is the same thing that I painted on on a piece of paper when I was on the phone in uh, what it m- must have been like eighty seven or something. So I'm gonna maybe try and and this doesn't have to go in the interview, but this is just between me and you. Um, I remember the logo coming through, and it it was I don't know it was very broken up. And yeah. I think Johnny or Hammy said something like, I don't know, maybe just, I don't know, retouch the ink because it's like broken up a little bit here and there. So I remember, al- not, I didn't alter it. It's, don't worry, I'm not like saying I, I had anything to do with it, but I sort of cleaned it up a little bit. It's not changed maybe. in any way. It's just that part of the biro was like wearing away somewhere and I just colored it in with black ink or something and made it more solid. And um... <laughs> what, what it was was like, you know, normal like ball pen on a piece of paper. That was, the, the first one I, I drew had a skull on it as well and he took the skull away and put Nick's ah. zombie swamp thing underneath instead of the skull. So that was probably also like him changing it a bit. But he's always acknowledged, it, you know, acknowledged me for it and, you know, he's, <laughs> it's, it's a great little extra thing. So going on to the third album, you changed logo again, and that that was obviously not. I had nothing to do with the artwork at all. Almost we neither. I, I would have to say, you know, because we totally. I can't, you know, the, all these, you know, because we were always so stubborn. You know, we were always like, we have this idea, we're going to follow it through, and then we forced everyone to like, like, you know, we wouldn't compromise a bit, and then, <laughs> and then, you say that album looks good, but for me, to me, the colors are like too hysterical, you know, and yeah, crazy. Yeah, it's a bit, it's a bit, a bit much to stomach for a metal album. For me, I really love what they did with the logo. We got to see that first, and that was like that got to be a classic logo after a while. So, 
me. They really did, did a good work there. But I can't remember how we came in contact with them. I think it was, you know, the guys from Mystery Love's company, they they, they used them for a couple of albums. And I, I think we just, like, we just went with it. They were called Frequent Form. It was like a designer company from Stockholm. When I got, got the, the art, artwork sent to me, it, you probably had got it. You know, this is probably what happened. You probably sent me a fax of it because I remember getting a fax when I was on doing press for the record in Belgium. And the fax came through uh, and the press girl was like showing it to me. That, oh, this is like the new artwork. What, what, you know, what do you reckon? And it looked pretty cool in black and white. And wow. also, again, you know, like how, how a fax machine kind of smears, making that almost punky photocopied look. And I was like, this is pretty cool. Yeah, let, let's go for that. Of course, I, I should have asked which colors are on the cover, but I couldn't. It's very colorful. I was pro- yeah, it's very colorful. I was probably more interested in like, you know, what's the, what's the taste of the next beer in Belgium? You know, and I was just like, <laughs> yeah, go for that one. But that, that was something I always remember about you guys from Scandinavia was that you were very interested in alcohol. Um... <laughs> Back in the days, yeah, that, that was quite a few. I mean, uh, we are pretty mellow nowadays. We, we can have, you know, a party night here and there, but... Uh, most of us, you know, yeah, we, we're, we're pretty down to earth. Uh, when it comes to shows and stuff, we're super professional, you know, when, when drinking before and all that. Back in the day, when you were like 20, you could probably, probably could drink 10 beers and still do a good show because you were, you know, had a different stamina. Now, I, you know, that, that wouldn't happen. <laughs> that's, that's also something that comes with maturity is that you don't mind saying it. Back in the day, you'd be like, oh, I can drink 20 beers, man, I'm cool. Now I'm like three beers, man. I'm fine with that, and I don't have a problem with saying yeah. it anymore. So I guess that's a real sign of maturity there. I guess that was the cool thing about back then is that I mean I could see you guys. Every record you were doing was getting more and more professional and sounding better, and the songwriting was getting more and more focused. You know, the sound was really coming along. Our focus and perspective changed all the time as well. We just wanted to, you know, challenge ourselves really. And and when we were 18, we wanted to, to challenge ourselves to write music. Music that no one has written before in a way you know what i'm saying yeah mix king crimson with with morbid angel or whatever we wanted to do but then when we turned 20 or 21 that kind of thing we have we had done that we had totally done the weirdest death metal record you can do and and then what is more challenging for us right now to write the more straightforward record because that that was a challenge too to try to strip it down to the bare essential that was another challenge and that's that's why we did that actually and looking back slaughter of soul is kind of like Every other at case record is more challenging and for the for the listener and everything. Even the new one, I think. Uh, but sort of result is like this insular incident in our history when we did, you know, thirty minutes of straightforward, you know, verse, chorus, bang. It's all aggression, whereas all the other records are more melancholic and you know, atmospheric. And even the new one has more in common with the old, older stuff, I think. So that's a very insular incident. The sort of result record, I, I would say. I could see there was like a big thing coming for you guys and I think Adrian might be able to sort of back me up on this because he was in Cradle and we were obviously touring America like with Ozfest and really big stuff and a lot of people would say you know there were young bands like uh, I can't remember what their names are Shadows Fall um, yeah all these American bands yeah. yeah God forbid all these bands and they were all like at the gates with a fucking reason I got into metal and all this shit and I, you know we were like wow me and Adrian were like fucking hell if that had only happened 20 years ago we'd have been cool right <laughs> yeah, yeah. we could see this like thing like bubbling underneath the surface of like you know everybody was giving you guys credit for um for starting something you probably didn't even realize at the time it was kind of cool yeah exactly and that, 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 that's what bands should do more I guess like break up them and then let the legacy kind of build on its own <laughs> So well, you can yeah. just come back and I think, you know, as I said, everything happens for a reason. You know, we, we, we wouldn't have been able to write a record like Slaughter of Soul if we wouldn't have been the persons we were. And the person we were were the persons who broke up the band when we, when, we, when it had the chance to get big because that yeah. was how artistically, you know, how we were. Did, looking back now, I mean, obviously it's something you can reflect on. I don't know. I mean, you can't change anything, but looking back, I mean, it must be weird, like, to, like I say, playing download and even like... I think I read, it might have been on your Wikipedia page where it said, like, number 30 in the top 50 best death metal frontmen. You know, and it's like, I don't know, it's, it's weird looking back, thinking you weren't doing it for that reason at all. You were just getting up there and giving your all and trying every record to get better and better and better and obviously, you know, play it to as many people. It was just, I don't know, something you just did. Yes, it has to come natural. I think that's why it still works because that's what we still want to do. And as I said, you know, you know, just just before this, like the career thing was never there, and it still isn't. You know, because 
that's why we still want our day jobs even if you know even if we play download we, we still want our fucking day jobs because it keeps our feet on the ground and we don't have to have at the gates to pay the bills yeah it's like well, what we do for fun you know well we you know when we want to exp- express ourselves and have fun together not like a work we never wanted to be a work and then i mean as a kid of course you you know you you were kind of focused on the art and also you were very kind of like aware of how people as we talked about the first thing like how people looked at you and you know you wanted to have as much attention as possible when you were 18 of course but you didn't want to compromise with your art so that yeah it's kind of like a fine balance that's why we're, that's why we're still here yeah so just to finish on, I've got to I've got to thank Dan Tobin for setting up this because when I asked Peaceful if they had any contact with you, they said, "Oh, we can try," and then it went nowhere. So I just messaged like Dan from an old email address, and he replied saying, "Yeah, Thomas was here like two days ago from download. <laughs> Here's his email." Yeah, address. that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, so I got to. Yeah, thank- we, we have stayed in touch the whole time, me and Dan, because you know, because as you were saying, you you kind of left the scene there, but Dan kind of you know joining Eric, he stayed on yeah. with us through through a very important part of our career as well, as well as being there, you know, back in the peaceful days. All those people back in the, those days, you know, that, that doesn't just go away, no. that, that kind of feeling. You know, it's kind of like, as a lot of us, lot of, at least a lot of you English people on, from the peaceful days have played in several of these bands. And I think that, you know, like an Asthma Malign Bride, you know, Cradle, you shared a pretty hand, pretty, yeah. a lot of members, you know. Oh, Martin Powell, for example, played them all three, right, you know? Yep. <laughs> and and um, I, I'm I'm just thinking like it, it is for a reason because it's kind of like this connection that will not go away from these old days. We we did it for the right reason then when we we are still here, kind of lifers in one in one sense or the other, you know. Some people say like you know do you, do you see the scene differently now? And I think well the scene back then for us was like it's only a hundred people and we're all swapping bands, and we can't seem to get anybody stupid yeah. enough to to get into that circle. So I guess it was a scene. Back then, it was you, you kind of knew everyone, and you were fans of each. You know, I loved Morbid Angel, I loved Carcass, I loved Cathedral, I loved all in bands. I knew them guys personally as well, because you, you know you used to go to festivals and they'd be there, and you, it, yeah. was, it was like a scene. I guess I don't like to cu- use that word particularly because it didn't feel like that at the time. We were just all. Having but I think it's like you know the equivalent of, of a local scene nowadays. You know, like when when people know each other, but then it was a global local yeah. scene. Yeah. Because it was local because in in the way that we had this extreme thing in common music that you know if you saw someone with a morbid angel shirt on town you'd be like freaking out you know <laughs> who's this <laughs> why why do I, don't i know this guy so that still happens to me sometimes and i you know i walk the street and i see a guy with an autopsy shirt i'd like it's like you know say hello to him and after like five minutes i was like i don't know that guy before you knew everybody that had an autopsy shirt in yeah. the world probably. probably i mean it's like the first nihilist shirt you know the first one you know the one that chris is wearing for the cover of Severed survival yeah there was like there was 20 of those made, and I know Nick uh, back in the day because he sent them all out, and I, I have one, of course, you know, and not, you know. But it's like he knew exactly which 20 people in the world had that shirt. It's it's always been a question I wanted to ask Phil Anselmo, because um, Dark Throne, he seemed to be a fan of theirs, yeah. And I was the person who was sending out those promo cassettes that we did for free. Yeah. And Phil said in an interview, like, when I guess when I don't know when it was, like. 20 years ago he said like oh yeah I got into these cool bands from this cassette I got from Peaceville and I thought I, surely I didn't influence Phil Anselmo to get into such music but maybe it was like he found it like a second hand shop or something yeah or maybe he just went to a radio show like and saw it and pinched it or borrowed it or you know they were free anyway and maybe yeah, someone yeah. didn't you, like you, it you can't remember sending it to him personally at least no, no. and it was probably more real as well, you know what I'm saying? They, they, uh, there was a real thing, you know? Yeah, I, I kind of came from that background, so it was like nicer for me, you know, working at Peaceville and then putting the shows together. I, get, I remember yeah. you guys doing a show in Amsterdam, I think, with My Dying Bride, or I can't remember. Yeah, 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 I remember that. It was like 93, and the I went... The Paradiso, wasn't it? Yeah, that's, and it was the first time I was in the, the audience where I actually felt really proud of what we were doing, because nobody yeah. knew who me and Hammy were, but from that f- initial phone call to sign a band like My Dying Bride and At The Gates and whoever was, you know, you kind of created that yourself just out of all and an idea and some bit of work with a cover and, you, you know, band and all yeah. that. And then there's like 500 fans all going crazy and you think, we just created this out of an idea. Yeah. We were very uh, proud. Yeah. That's, the, that's the satisfaction, you know, like, you know, you, you have this thing. You look back on it, you know, like all these different records you've done, whatever, and it's like it all started with 
as you say, an idea. It's like, what about this? You know, what about you know this riff? And how can we? And then all of a sudden, you're on stage and download playing that riff. It's like, oh shit, what happened here? You know? yeah. you look <laughs> well, back, it's like, did, did 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 we have that riff a year ago? No, we didn't. <laughs> you know, that's weird, isn't it? Still works, doesn't it? <laughs> Very cool. So the the last thing I wanted to do was, um, I don't know if you remember the Peaceful uh, Sampler Volume Four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the first band on there we were trying to push at the time, I think it was '92, was Pentagram. Yeah, and I've, I had to work with Bobby Liebling a lot. We put yeah. them on the compilation first, trying to push them, and then the last band on there is you guys with Kingdom yeah. Gone. And I don't know why. I, I, it was like our secret weapon was Def Records. It was like obviously like you guys came through uh, on that label. Therian did the first album there. Pitch Shifter, Vital Remains. It was like I think Johnny was crazy about Dissection. He wanted to sign Dissection. Yeah, uh, Dissection was on the death metal compilation. I remember that. But it was just funny comparing that, like, uh, you know, Pentagram to, to you guys and where you get, you know, the both bands are where you are now. I'm kind of, I don't know, it, even I'm surprised when I see people wearing shirts in the street. I'm mind-blowing. It really is kind of proud. Yeah. And, and in a way, a bit sad. I wish it would have been like that when you guys were really trying back then. Well, I mean, yeah, as, as I said, everything happens for a reason. We we didn't, I don't think we ever really became bitter, you know, and not even when we were doing the really small stuff because, you know, everything was new. <laughs> everything was like, shit, we're doing this. You're too drunk to it, realize. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, maybe too. But I, I think we, you know, just, we came from the bedroom, just like, you know, screaming along to possessed records in the in the bedroom, just like three years, four years earlier than playing that Paradiso show, you know. So that's that's not a lot of years to go that far. So that's that we, we were already happy to be there, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it was a very good show. I remember that show, and I think my dying bride were sleeping in the van outside. Um, oh shit! Yeah, probably. Yeah, I remember one of those tours. We, Anathema and us, we slept <laughs> on the on the fucking pavement outside the club in in Holland. Yeah, I yeah. remember. I think I might have been there. There was a mattress outside. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Darren and those guys. Yeah, shit. Yeah. So thanks for your time, Thomas. Oh, thank you, man. No, no worries. It was good times traveling back in time for a bit. <laughs> it always feels like that's a special place. And you know, when I look at pictures, like you know, it's really like you know, shit. This is where we started, really. What came after was Slaughter of the Soul and all that. That was just like, yeah. that just happened. But yeah. the, the peaceful days, that was like, that was our start, really. True meaning of underground. Yeah.